Every year, hundreds of doctors apply for future training into the field of cardiology, and many unfortunately are rejected and turned away. For example, in 2023, out of nearly 1,700 applicants, more than 500 were turned away and didn't match into a fellowship program. But fortunately, I was one of the lucky few to find that I did match into my number one program into cardiology on my first try. Here's a clip of me crying about it as soon as I found out. So today I'm gonna break down everything that I did to get into a competitive fellowship like cardiology on my first try into my number one program, but also doing it while applying to significantly less programs than most people do. And number four, by the way, is the most important, so make sure you stay tuned. Now number one is research. Now with any type of fellowship or additional training like cardiology, research is usually required, mainly because it's an easy way to show that you're interested and have invested in the field during early parts of training in medical school and residency. And so while research is important, particularly within the field of cardiology, that doesn't mean you have to have dozens and dozens of publications. I frankly didn't and there's tons of applicants who get in every single year that may just have a few projects that never actually went to the finish line of being published but ultimately what matters and I'll share with you guys my research stats in a second is just contributing to a project with some meaningful contribution so whether you're doing data collection actually working with the subjects if it's actual clinical trial getting information in the backgrounds writing the manuscripts whatever you may be doing and then taking that as far as that project will go with assistance of your mentors and researchers whether that means through a full-on publication or something like an abstract or a poster presentation or just presenting that to your fellow residents or medical students, all that counts as a form of research that you've done that then can go into your application. So personally, by the time that I was submitting my application for cardiology fellowship, I had about three to five publications from medical school alone. In addition, there were projects that never actually made it to publication, but maybe I did an abstract on them or I did a poster presentation or I did a presentation in front of the residency program. All those went into my CV and so that gave me a nice healthy list. Now, with all that being said, in full disclaimer, I by no means think that I'm a researcher in the field of cardiology. I don't think it's gonna be necessarily involved into my future, but it's something that you should try out because again, it shows people that you're at least interested and invested in the field, and at least you gave it a shot because some people do find out that they're pleasantly surprised. I actually like this. So if you're interested in the field of cardiology and you don't have some research experience, try to find a few mentors that possibly you could be doing research with. Send them all kind of a template email of like who you are, what you'd like to do, and ask them if they have any projects that they can help kind of finish or start, and then maybe you'll have a few meetings with them and then you choose based off your interest and which sounds like the easiest thing for you to contribute with your busy schedule that you'd like to do. As a pro tip, I'd recommend taking out about one to two projects at a time because usually some projects will be delayed or maybe you'll be waiting on something to be done for one project and then you can go ahead and work on another. That just gives you a little bit of diversity when it's time to submit your application. Maybe one of them turns into a publication, another one just an abstract, but you get the benefit of both work. And number two is your clinical performance or your rotation performance. Now this goes for all rotations. Just like when you're in medical school applying a residency, if you're going to be a surgeon, you still want to do well on your internal medicine rotation just to show that you're a good clinician and that you're willing to work hard, even if it's a field that you're not necessarily interested in. So you want to make sure that you do well on all of your residency rotations in internal medicine, but also when it's time to get into that cardiology ICU or a cardiology consult service, whatever you may have at your institution, you want to absolutely crush it. And so some pro tips that you can do before your rotation is just to learn some of the basics and that way you can come in with a nice foundation. So make sure you understand some of the guideline directed therapies for things like heart failure, how to do basic things like reading EKG, just having a flow and a structure, maybe managing somebody with a heart attack or chest pain, um, managing somebody with brand new arrhythmias, and some of the complex things that you may see in the ICU. Just create a list of topics and go down through them one by one. And as you're going through your rotation, you find new topics that you're not quite familiar with, go ahead and add them to your list and then add them to your evening and morning reading before you go into work. Now, having a solid foundation is literally the base of what you should be doing. A lot of what your clinical rotation performances and what people will write about you that end up on your dean's letter when you're applying to fellowship really just comes out to the character of the person that you are. Now you wanna be a good clinician, but there's tons of smart people who don't get into cardiology fellowship and that's because they're usually missing a little bit of an extra oomph. An easy way to do this is make sure that you are just a strong leader of your team. Usually by the time that you're being evaluated for something like fellowship, you're usually a second and third year resident, meaning you're considered an upper level. You're usually supervising some of the interns, maybe even some of the second years. You may have some medical students on your service and you're expected in addition to a fellow that you may have on your service to lead the team and your attending is supposed to help guide you guys. So the more that you can do to make your team look good, the better the reflection will be on you. For example, when I was on my cardiology IC rotation, it was time to just go ahead and work my butt off. First thing I wanted to do is to make sure that I knew everything about every single patient, both on my side as well as my buddy team. Often there'd be two upper level residents at a time, so if my fellow upper level was off on that day, I wanted to make sure that I knew about their patients that could help their fellow intern. 
Now, in addition to knowing just the basics of what's going on with every patient, I also wanted to make sure that all the team members that were taking care of these various patients felt comfortable with the plan. So that meant I wanted to make sure the interns knew what they were doing or wanted to do, and then giving them suggestions based on my experience of like, maybe we should try this for X, Y, and Z reason. Over time, after the span of three to four weeks, you could see how they can start thinking like you based on the experiences that you've shared with them. In a similar fashion with the medical students that were on that rotation doing their sub I as a fourth year medical student, it's the same thing. I would ask them basically which patients they would be taking care of, what their thought process was helping guide and shift that based off of guidelines and my own experience and also what I knew the attending would want. And then ideally when we go into rounds and the attending would show up for the first time, the fellow is expected to hear kind of broken presentations. And if you worked your butt off, everyone is on the same page offering good recommendations. They may still need some shifting based off what the fellow and attending want, but you have a team that just feels like they're cohesive. And that starts with you as the upper level resident. So it's not only about being smart within the field of cardiology, there was so much more that I had left to learn that I was taught on those rotations, but simply having a team that felt cohesive and in control where you feel like you're the leader and everyone can look at you for support really does create a strong culture. And that definitely gets reflected on both your recommendation letters if you do ask for them, as well as your valuations that end up on your Dean's letter. And as a final pro tip, from my personal experience, the last time that I did my cardiology ICU rotation, I had one of my attendings basically tell me that for the first week, she thought that I was one of the fellows. She was a new attending, she really didn't really know who the fellows were, and she thought that I was the fellow in the service. And that just speaks not necessarily to my level of knowledge, but the ability to just create a team where everyone's calm on the same page, and that's what your attending wants. And as a pro tip, if you really want to get that extra oomph on your rotations and have it show up on your evaluation, make sure as an upper level resident that you're focused on teaching. So sometimes that means learning the basics of cardiology of things that you don't feel comfortable with yet, practicing them at home, teaching them on a whiteboard, and then coming into your rotation and setting time to teach your medical students and your interns. You'll find that not only will your med students and your interns learn, but your learning will also be more cohesive and often Often your faculty and your fellows start to notice oh, upper level resident is teaching. This is awesome. I love this team. This team is cohesive. This is what they want. And again, it all reflects upon you without you ever having to kiss up or do anything extra. You're just working your butt off. You're interested in cardiology. This is how you do it. Now, number three is working on your outside cardiology learning. Now, depending on your institution, it's going to be very dependent on how much cardiology exposure you get. There are gonna be some residency programs that when you're an intern and a resident, you're gonna have amazing cardiology exposure just because of where you are. On the flip side, there's gonna be some that's gonna have a very general bread and butter. Well, you'll see your heart failure, your arrhythmias, some heart attacks, and that's about it. You don't see LVADs or heart transplants or some crazy other diseases that you may transfer to other hospitals. It's just gonna depend on where you're doing your residency. And to make sure that you're not missing out, you wanna have some extra time set whether it's during your drives into work or back to work or during your workouts where you're listening or just constantly learning about new things. Some easy and effective resources that were super helpful during my three years of residency as well as my gap year right now as a hospitalist include listening to podcasts such as the Cardio Nerds podcast or This Week in Cardiology, which is a Medscape podcast. It's just both very quick to the point and teaches you something that you probably didn't know about the field of cards, particularly as a resident or a med student and even now as somebody who's about to be a cardiology fellow, but also websites like the Jack website, which I'll put down below, or Wave Maven. If you're somebody who's struggling learning EKGs, is something that I use intensively through my three years of residency to really just get more comfortable of looking at an EKG and like, what the heck is that? And over time, you're like, I think I've seen this pattern before. So if you guys want to practice your EKGs, it's a free website. I'll link that down below. Now, beyond the obvious of just improving your cardiology foundation, the reason that this is important is that it helps in your future conversations. Usually on your fellowship interviews, they want to know about you. They want to know about why you want to go into cardiology. And so the more reasons you can have of saying, oh, that was so cool. So if you're listening to someone on a podcast, you're like, that's freaking awesome. Or this history of cardiology is freaking cool. Or that case was super interesting. Or this research article I read was super fascinating. If you can have more of those experiences within your tool belt to share on interviews and in your applications, you just look like you're more interested, more invested. That's ultimately what they want when it's time to pick a fellow. And finally, number four, and probably the most impactful for me, is to think about your future goals and niche within the field of cardiology. Now keep in mind that when you're applying to a fellowship program, they may have like three spots. For example, the program that I got into has three fellows as of next year, I'm one of them. The program where I did my internal medicine residency is much bigger and they have seven to eight. So even that is a small size. So you have hundreds of people competing for these two to eight spots, thus making it very competitive. And so you wanna make sure that when you show up for your interviews, not only do you have the grades, not only do you have experience, not only do you have people who vouch for you, because likely if you made it to the interview process, 
everyone who's sitting in that chair has the same, but you wanna be able to present a clear picture of what your contribution and direction within the field of cardiology will be. And by no means does it have to be crystal clear, but right now, based off your experience, they're going to ask you, are you going to be somebody who's going to be a great researching cardiologist, a great clinician within the field of cardiology, somebody who's going to be focusing on cardiology education, women's health, you know, advocacy or public health within the field of cardiology. So ask yourself based off your experiences and your attractions to the field of cardiology, which of those are going to be the places that you likely will pigeonhole yourself maybe 10 years from now, things will change, but that's gonna be the direction that you wanna sell yourself to these fellowship programs and also evaluate, will this program allow me to have this life if that's something that I continue on to pursue? If you wanna be, for example, an electrophysiologist who wants to focus on education and the program you're applying to doesn't offer an electrophysiology fellowship in addition to where you're about to do or really lack of training in education may not be the best fit. So having a niche based off your experiences not only helps the program understand this person is serious, I can clearly see that they thought about this answer, but this person that can also fit nicely into the program, we absolutely want them. So in a personal example, as you guys know, I've been creating content on MD Journey since like 2016, my second year of medical school and on YouTube since like 2018. By 100% accident, I found that I absolutely love content creation to be able to help with online education. In the setting of the MD Journey, I'm teaching you guys about my experiences so you can have the successes and avoid the failures that I've had. But ideally, I can also translate that into patient care in the field of cardiology. I'm really excited to be able to do that. I talked about that in every single interview that I went to. So then by the time I walked away, everyone remembered, that's the guy who's working as a hospitalist who also has a YouTube channel. It was easy to be memorable. I knew the niche that I carved out for myself. But also as I walked away from each program that I interviewed at, I knew probably not a good fit, or this would be amazing if I got here. Now, if you enjoyed this breakdown and overview of how I got into cardiology fellowship and you guys want more to help you succeed on your medical journey, then click down below to get access to the absolutely free med school success handbook. This is 60 plus, I think it's like 17,000 word document that I'm still updating on a weekly basis with tips that I wish somebody gave me on my first day of medical school, residency, and so on. So if you guys want access to that, absolutely free, just link down below. And if you're somebody who is about to start residency as a part of your medical journey and you're interested in just crushing it as a brand new intern, particularly in the field of internal medicine, definitely check out our intern survival guide, highly reviewed and step-by-step -step process how to be more efficient and basically just look like a superstar from the get-go. And as the making of this episode, myself and the rest of the MD Journey team is definitely interested in doing some workshops to help you succeed on your medical journey, but particularly within the clinical year. So whether it's on your rotations and residency to ideally get into those competitive residencies as well as competitive fellowships. So if you're interested in some of these workshops, just let me know in the comments section down below what you'd like to see. And the more interest I see down below, the quicker that we'll get to working on these workshops. But as always, my friends, hopefully this helped you guys on your journey. Thank you so much for being a part of mine. And if you enjoyed this one, check out this episode right here on all the reasons why I picked the field of cardiology, as well as this right here on my full day as of right now, a full-time hospitalist. Enjoy these, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.